Hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you back to another episode of this fabulous series. I don't know about you, but I am definitely beside myself because of the amount of uh, passages that we're going through from the Old Testament to show the doctrine of the Trinity. And as I mentioned earlier, it's no better than having our dear brother Anthony Rogers, who's so passionate about this particular topic, to join me here in studio. Anthony, welcome back, brother. It's great to be back. And you know, Anthony, during one of our breaks, as we were preparing for this, uh, you know, we reflected back uh, concerning the importance of all of these passages and the harmony that comes about when you start looking at it. Could you could you elaborate a little bit more and show people why is it important that you show that many passages? You know, sometimes people say, okay, well, one or two passages are enough. Why isn't that enough sometimes? Why is it important for us to show different pieces from the Old Testament and New Testament to show the big picture? Right. If, if the Bible was written by one person, we would not be surprised if it had remarkable consistency. Correct. You'd expect exactly. a person to be consistent with his own thoughts, right? Uh, no person is fully consistent. Uh, unless they're inspired, there's going to be imperfections. Uh, but it's not surprising if there's a lot of consistency with, with one person. You know, one person eating the same sorts of foods, right? He's, he's, he's always going to like the foods that he likes, and so you're not going right. to expect a lot of inconsistency. But uh, So it's remarkable when you turn to the Bible and realize that we're not dealing with one person's writings, not even a handful of people writing during the same time period. Rather, we're looking at people who are writing across the span of 1,500 years or so. That's right, yeah. On different continents, from different walks of life. With three different languages, primarily Hebrew, Greek, and some Aramaic. Right. And so to find this kind of consistency in the writings is remarkable. And it's not you know, just a consistency between Old Testament writers, but Old Testament writers and New Testament writers. That's correct, exactly. Right. Today we'll actually get in a little bit into the New Testament. Our focus is the Old, but uh, you know, we just can't avoid saying something about how this connects to the New, and that's, that's right. ultimately where we want people to go with it anyways. But. And, and so far, for instance, we, we covered like from different books in Old Testament, but different authors also. We have Isaiah, you know, we have Job, we have uh, Moses a couple of times in, you know, uh, from Exodus, for instance. Later on, I think, if I recall, we're going to start talking about Joshua, and we're going to talk about, uh, you know, Jeremiah and others. I mean, and you mentioned today, uh, definitely we're going to get into the New Testament at, as, as just a teaser to show right. how the Jewishness of the writing of the old, uh, writers of the Old Testament, uh, I mean, New Testament, capitalize on their knowledge from uh, the Old Testament by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I mean, the idea is that these things are not done by accident. I mean, I, I, I love it when our Muslim friends, and I used to think this way, it's like, you know, somebody sat down, really, from the Jewish side and the Christian side, and somehow they came up with this perfect plan, you know, deleting things, you know, corrupting, and somehow the book is harmonious. Well, what does that say about God, if that's the case? As if these people overpowered God, came up with a perfect plan, and no one can discover the scheme that was done which is a sad thing, obviously. Right, and of course it doesn't make a lot of sense anyways. Yeah. Why would Jews be conspiring with, to make their Christians. book consistent with our book? <laughs> exactly. Right? Uh, so the fact that they're harmonious given you know, contrary expectations, at least Muslim expectations, is, yeah. is remarkable. To the contrary. I mean, some uh, many times you feel like, you know, the uh, uh, rabbis are struggling to actually explain something because the New Testament now is kind of like putting pressure on them and showing right. them that this is the logical way to explain it, basically. Right. Well, um, you mentioned today we're going to start with Isaiah 63 and revisit this passage again. However, the theme we can say for today's episode has to do with the person of the Holy Spirit. So let's show, for instance, uh, the uh, first part of Isaiah 63, and people can see that on the screen right now. Right. So we've been looking at Isaiah 63 because it mentions all three persons, and I also pointed out that it looks backwards and forward. This is Isaiah saying, this is what God did in the past. He saved us by means of the angel of his presence and his spirit. And he's also looking forward to the future, praying that God will do for Israel what he did for them in the past, which means Isaiah has this expectation that God will save again by means of the angel of his presence and the Holy Spirit. And so in 
a couple of the previous uh, episodes, we focused on the angel of the Lord. We saw that he's also referred to as the arm of the Lord. That's right. And that led us to Isaiah 53, where the arm of the Lord is identified as the coming Messiah. So today I want to look at this text again to remind us what it says about the Holy Spirit. So in verses 7 through 8, uh, it speaks about the Lord, right? his loving kindness and how he uh, saved the people of Israel. He had adopted them as his children, it says in verse 8. He says, surely they're my people, sons who will not deal falsely. So he became their savior. Right. And now as we move to the next slide. And before that, I mean, I, I know I mentioned it before, and if you don't mind me, Anthony, I just want to, I like to highlight things like this because to me, as someone who comes from a Muslim background, the, these are rich reminders to me that I have a heavenly father. Mm. It is our Lord himself who is calling me his son, not right. just my people, only his sons. That mean I can really call him my father. And if you recall, I mentioned in Isaiah 63 and 64, that's exactly what Isaiah says. You are our father. I mean, he, he was so passionate about the relationship with God. This is the beauty about the, the Lord that we worship. We can call him father. And on top of this, look, he became their savior. You see, we worship a God that took it upon himself to save us because he knows we cannot save ourselves, brother. Right. right. So let's move on now to the next one. Uh, this one is also from Isaiah 63, and people right. can see it, uh, passages from 9 to 10. Right. So it's the same section. It says, God saw the affliction of his people, and in all their uh, affliction then, it says, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his mercy, he redeemed them, and he lifted them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So here's the, the mention of the Spirit. Therefore, he turned himself to become their enemy. He fought against them. And if we go to the next slide, there's another reference to the Spirit. And we're going to highlight it. I, I'm again, brother, I'm sorry. I'm cutting you off. I apologize. No, no, I no. just want people to see the rich, uh, richness of this. You know. So you have the angel of his presence. We would argue later that this is the person of our Lord. His is the pronoun reference to the Father. And here we have the Holy Spirit. So the members are right there, clearly right. are right there. I mean, no one can dispute it. I mean, unless if you're really going to mess with the grammar, it's impossible for you to argue that you're not seeing different members and all of them together are called God, technically speaking. Right, right. So, so now we're going to go to the next one. Right. So what, what I'm doing here is simply uh, reminding us what we've already seen, that all three persons are mentioned, because Isaiah has a lot more to say about the Spirit, as does the Old Testament as a whole. Uh, but here he goes on to say, Then his people remembered the days of old of Moses. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit in the midst of them? who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the depths. Like the horse in the wilderness, they did not stumble. As the cattle which go down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So you led your people to make for yourself a glorious name. So now we, we've got all three persons in this text. That's right. But the thing I particularly wanted to focus on based on Isaiah 63 and some of the other passages we'll look at, is the personhood of the Spirit. Because what often happens is people will say this is just another way of referring to the Father. Now certainly there's a fundamental unity between the Spirit and the Father. Other God, otherwise God won't be one, right. if that's the case. Right. Yeah. So there, there's an essential unity here. That there's no question that the Spirit is one with the Father and for, by that, uh, for that same reason also one with the angel of the Lord or his glorious arm. But the personhood of the Spirit, it really stands out here because we've already seen it mentions in the previous verses that they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. You can't rebel against a impersonal thing which mm -hmm. is how some people want to understand the That's Spirit. That's right, exactly. I mean, you're going to rebel, rebel against power, right. you know, or, or just something, you know? Yeah, the, the electricity in the wall isn't offended now by my actions. Exactly. Right? It's, it doesn't have a second <laughs> thought about my actions, much less a first thought, right? So uh, the Spirit can be rebelled against, just like we can rebel against the Father, and can rebel against the angel of his presence. Exactly. And he can be grieved by our rebellion. That's right. And isn't that what the New Testament tells us, right? Don't grieve the Spirit of God, Absolutely. Paul says in, in Ephesians. Yeah. So, uh, and, and by the way, he's called the Holy Spirit, and that's why he would be grieved by our rebellion. So 
Very clearly, the spirit is not uh, an impersonal thing, neither is he a creature, because the spirit of the Lord is here associated with the redemption of Israel. Redemption is a divine activity, and we're told that the spirit is the one that they're rebelling against. It's, so he's not just you know another Israelite or even an angel. He's someone who must be obeyed, and when you transgress, you're transgressing against. Moreover, it also says that the Spirit is the one who gave them rest, which is the ultimate goal of God's activities. He's trying to bring us into his salvific rest. That's right, right? exactly. And so let, let's take a look at Isaiah 61. Okay. So, so here we have another passage, and, and again, uh, notice three persons, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's the same book, same author. In fact, it's just two chapters prior, right? And I want to show it here. One person, the Lord, and me, the person who's speaking. Right. So it says, the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Now, the me here, if you're just thinking in terms of Isaiah 63, would have to be the angel of his presence, right? Right. And but But we realize that what's going on here is this is a messianic prophecy. How do we know? Because in Luke... 4, 16 to 18, the Lord himself applied it to himself. That's right. Yeah. And, th and this is consistent with what we read earlier in a previous episode. Remember, we looked at Isaiah 11, where it talks about the spirit of the Lord uh, resting upon the shoot that would stem from Jesse, the, the right. father of David. So all these things, again, they tie together. There's a consistency here. Now we have three persons, but one of those persons is the coming Messiah. But uh, the Spirit is going to rest upon him. It says, uh, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. So uh, again, we see the Spirit and his activity is that of a person, not, a, not of some impersonal force. In fact, if we go to the next slide, we see that even uh, further. That will be in Isaiah 32, which people are looking at right now. Right. Here it says, uh, because the palace has been abandoned, uh, it's a different context, but uh, because the palace has been abandoned, the populated city forsaken, hill and watchtower have become caves forever, a delight for wild donkeys, a pasture for flocks, until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field is considered as a forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness will abide in the fertile field. So Isaiah is looking forward to a time here when the Spirit will be poured out again. And that time is ultimately the time of the Messiah's coming, right? Because and, and, the Spirit… And Joel talked about the same thing. You know? Right. Yeah. So the Spirit's going to rest upon the Messiah, and because of that, he's also going to be uh, poured out upon us. The, the Messiah is going to bring the Spirit with him and once again make his people uh, you know, abound in, in his Spirit like they did at the time of the Exodus. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Let's see if we have uh, more. And indeed, uh, you know, for instance, uh, we have Isaiah 44, verses 2 to 3. Yeah, again, uh, same idea. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant. And you, Jeshurun, which is another name for Israel, whom I have chosen. For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. So again, we have a promise of the future outpouring of the Spirit. And so remember, we, in Isaiah 63, I said it looks back and it looks forward. It shows what God did. It shows what he will do. These passages reiterate that same point. God is once again going to send forth his Messiah right. and his Spirit, and he is going to effect, again, a deliverance for his people. We're not focused on redemption, per se. We're focused on the, the triune God as the one back of redemption. But uh, one of the things we learn from the prophets is that this future redemption is going to be greater than what God did in the past. That This redemption is not just going to be a physical or temporal deliverance from physical captivity. Right. It's going to be eternal redemption. And so here, uh, like I said, the spirit and uh, the angel or the Messiah are going to be the ones who come in the future, like they did in the past, to accomplish God's promised redemption. And here I like to always highlight things like this. You know, a language like this is so exciting to me because it says, I will pour out my spirit on specifically your offsprings, speaking of what Jacob, Israel, the servant of God, basically the people of God, my blessings on your descendants, the same thing, 
What I like to highlight here is the Spirit of the Lord is omnipresent. He's going to be in all of them. Same person, but in all of them. And that's one of the attributes of God, basically. Right. Right. So the Spirit is personal and divine. That's right. Exactly. And you mentioned something about uh, God sending His Messiah. Here now, in the next passage in Isaiah 59, clearly it's talking about this Messiah, as we will see here. Right. So here, again, uh, you have all three persons. And it's remarkable. You know, you hear people uh, act as if the the Trinity is not present or it's not in one verse. Obviously, not everything is said in one verse, but you have more passages than most people realize that actually do speak of all three at the same time while in one way or another identifying them as persons and as those who either have divine attributes or are performing divine prerogatives. And so, uh, Scripture is a lot fuller than many people realize. But here in Isaiah 59, notice it says, a Redeemer will come to Zion. That passage is quoted by Paul in the New Testament and, and applied to Jesus. But a Redeemer will come to Zion, and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. So the Lord is speaking of a Redeemer to come. Right. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit, which is upon you, the Messiah, the Redeemer, remember it says, the Lord God is sending me with his spirit. Amen. My spirit which is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. Amen. And so again, the anticipation in Isaiah is, is very clear. The God who is going to save his people in the future is the same God who revealed himself in the past. And that God is tripersonal, three persons. That's right. And so, so we want to, I mean, I want to show the Redeemer here is sent as a person, obviously. The Spirit of the Lord will be upon this Redeemer. That's what Isaiah 61, for instance, says. That's what Jesus applied to himself. But let's see now how one of the authors of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, applied the same thing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the coming of the Redeemer, our Lord, the Messiah himself, in Galatians chapter 4. Right. This is a rich text for so many reasons. But uh, Paul says, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son. Now, it's, it's very important to underscore this. The shoot, right? You know? Came yeah. For, you know? But, but notice it, it says he sent forth. This word in, in Greek is, is very uh, explicit. It's very strong. It's not the ordinary word for send. It's ex apostelain. So you might recognize that last word. It's, it sounds apostle. like apostle, yeah, right? Exactly. But uh, apostle, it has this other word joined to it, ex apostelain. What it's saying is Auto. God sent out of him, you know, himself, himself or exactly. from himself yeah. his son made of a woman. Mm -hmm. And, and then what, what I'm drawing attention to is the idea that the Son then exists before he becomes That's a That's right. He being. came from the Father, you know, right. basically. We're not saying anything here. We're saying we came from the presence of the Father. That's what I wanted to say, basically. Yeah. Yeah. He, he came forth from the Father, was born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem. There's that term, redeem. That's right. Remember? Yeah. So in previous episodes, we saw this is what the, the angel of his presence did for God's people, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. That's Remember right. when God saved the people at the time of the Exodus, he said, uh, these are my sons. He, he brought them to himself That's right. That's right. Uh, as sons and became their father to them through, through his salvation. Obviously, there is no physical relationship with a woman here. I'm sure you guys can see that. Right. Uh, this is referring to a divine activity where God sends forth his son and causes him to be conceived in her womb. Uh, and that's described more in the Gospels. It's a supernatural act of the Spirit. Uh, but then notice what it goes on to say in verse 6. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So once again, we see the sent forth here. Right. Sent forth, and another one related to the Spirit, sent forth. Right. So both the Son and the Spirit are sent forth, and by this God redeems his people, and he brings them to himself as his sons. That's right. Now there's a fundamental distinction between what Christ is as his Son and what we are, and Christ is his Son by nature, not that God physically produced him or anything. God's not a, a man. Uh, this is referring to a spiritual sameness, right? The, the Father and the Son share the same nature. Mm -hmm. 
and, and he's God's son then in this transcendent sense. But by virtue of the fact that the Son has been sent on our behalf and has taken our nature and is now going to redeem us through his death, when his Spirit comes and dwells in our hearts, he's joining us to Jesus. Amen. And this is what enables us, through Jesus, to call upon God as our Father. That's right. So, so it's beautiful. It ties in with the Old Testament, but it also, as I said, it, it shows us a greater redemption. This is not like that old redemption. That old redemption was glorious. If we were among the people of Israel, we would be rejoicing that God right. delivered us out of captivity. But here it's talking about eternal redemption, redemption from sin and salvation forever with God as our Father. Amen. And uh, we are no longer, as a result of this, slaves to what? To sin. We are free now. That's why accepting Christ is very important. Now I'm speaking to those who are watching us. Uh, especially my Muslim uh, people, that this is why Jesus is essential because through this redemptive work that God in his love for you has sent his son and has empowered him by his Holy Spirit, but also us as believers are empowered by the Holy Spirit because he dwells in us. Unless you have that relationship with God in Christ, you will never not only understand what we're saying, but even appreciate this freedom that Christ gives to us. Thank you, Amen. brother, as always. And uh, I'm excited uh, for uh, what we will be discussing next. So I appreciate you taking the time to be with us here and to even uh, pour out your heart and uh, this rich list of these passages that I pray and hope that everybody's been taking notes and go back and watch it again and again. And trust me, the more you do it, the more you become uh, fluent in understanding it, and also you can apply it even more efficient in your dialogue and discussions. Thank you again for joining us. This is Al Fadi. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video, and we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.